Good day and welcome to the GEO Institute fourth annual live streaming web conference. Today's topic will be earthquake engineering and soil dynamics and the program facilitator is Paolo Simaro. This is an audio web conference. You will hear the presentation through your computer speakers and there will be a PowerPoint presentation that will be shown throughout the meeting. You can ask a question through the online web conference tool at any point during the session by clicking on the Ask Question button on the left of your screen. Type your question into the box and hit the Send button to submit your question. I'd now like to turn the floor over to today's facilitator, Paolo Sumaro. Please, sir, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Geo Institute Earthquake Engineering and Soil Dynamics Technical Committee, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2019 Earthquake Engineering and Soil Dynamics Web Conference. Um, my name is Paolo Zimmer, I'm at UCLA, uh, and I will serve today as the facilitator for the web conference. Um, before we start, I would like to acknowledge three individuals who made these webinars possible, Guillermo Diaz for Fananes, at uh, WSP, New York, Professor Ashley Morales Cartagena, who is the director of the Civil Engineering Department in Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic, uh, and Professor Scott Brandenburg at UCLA, uh, who is the ESD 2019 committee chair. So today's presenters, uh, as you'll see, will have uh, presentations on a very interesting broad um, uh, topics uh, related to, of course, geotechnical engineering and um, deep learning, big data in civil engineering and physical modeling. The first presenter will be Sajat Salam. Uh, the presentation that he will make will be titled The Strain History and Short Period Aging Effects on the Strength and Liquefaction Behavior of Fine Grain uh, call refuse. We will then transition to the second presentation by Umar Basara. Uh, the title is Influence of Tall Buildings on Seismic Response of Shallow Underground Structures. Uh, we'll be then um, continue with Okan Nilan, uh, Deep Learning Based Site Amplification Models for Central and Eastern North America. We'll then transition to Eva Corre, who will present uh, on the centrifuge physical modeling for soil liquefaction, state of the art. And then the last presentation will be by myself. Uh, I'll be talking about the use of big data and geotechnical engineering, the next generation liquefaction project. As you can see, we have a variety of topics and I hope you'll all, you'll all enjoy uh, these um, topics in, uh, with regards to um, geotechnical engineering in general. Uh, each presentation will be about 20 minutes and then it will be followed by a two to three minute question answer session. Um, you'll, you'll be able to submit your questions uh, via the web interface and the presenters will be happy to uh, respond to those right after the presentation. Um, before we continue, I would like to uh, thank our gold sponsor, Keller Foundations. Um, the companies of Keller in North America are uniquely positioned to handle the most complex geotechnical construction projects nationwide. Uh, by including all services in one contract, Keller Foundations reduce client risk and ensure all aspects of a project. Uh, making sure that uh, are met on time and on budget. Um, so thanks again to our gold sponsor, Keller Foundations. Um, without now further ado, let me uh, introduce our first presenter. Uh, our fir first presenter will be Sajad Salam, who is currently a PhD candidate at Penn State um, he has a very uh, strong background and experience in industry, which includes design and forensic engineering projects, such as underground mine stability, reinforced swap design, sheet pile stability analysis. Uh, he also um, um, 
um, during his PhD, uh, his research focuses on liquefaction behavior of soils and tailings and the influencing factors such as strain history and aging on the liquefaction resistance. This is going to be today's topic. Um, uh, the research of Sajad focus include geotechnical earthquake engineering, geotechnical numerical and physical modeling, transportation uh, geotechnics, and infrastructure sustainability. So without further ado, uh, let me please give the floor to Sajad Salam, uh, a PhD candidate at Penn, at Penn State University, for his presentation entitled The Strain History and Short Period Aging Effects on the Strength and Liquefaction Behavior of Fine-Grained Coal Refuse. Thank you, Paolo, for the nice introduction, and everyone from State College, Pennsylvania. As uh, even through the introduction, my name is Sajad Salam, and I'm currently a PhD candidate in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at Pennsylvania State University. And my today's presentation is on strain history and short period aging effects on the strength and liquid action behavior of fine grain coal refuse. Uh, the research objectives in this study mainly included characterization of the material used in the experiment, which is fine grain coal refuse collected from a tailings dam close to an Appalachian coal field in Pennsylvania. Then the FCR is evaluated for nuclear fraction susceptibility and nuclear fraction resistance. Finally, we dig further and investigate the influence of strain history and short period aging on the nuclear fraction behavior. Our approach in this experimental study was to use the largest scale shake table test to overcome the shortcomings of the element testing, which a few of them are listed here. And the element testing methods such as cyclic track, fuel and cyclic DSS, the stratified medium of tailings in field cannot be represented. Consequently, the water film effects and water distribution during and after the cyclic test cannot be properly captured. In addition, the reconstituted samples do not usually possess the same structure and fabric that tailings have in the field. Considering its shortcomings, we were compelled to use the 1G shake table system with a single degree of freedom in Penn State University, as shown in the left figure. And uh, we used instruments such as speedometers and LEDs to measure the cyclic response of the specimen throughout the experiment. We were also able to calculate the developed shear strain during the shaking event using the LVC reading and the arrangement and location of the measurements are shown in the right figure. We deposited the FCR specimen inside the laminar shear box. We first hung and fixed the speedometers inside the box and then we basically used the hydraulic filling method introduced by Whitman 1970 and we mixed moist FCR with water with volume ratio of one to one and a half. And this ratio was simply selected to obtain in a slurry form that is possible for the pump to start the slurry and outflow inside the box as shown in the figure. Uh, and to avoid, uh, although the final FCR specimen won't be uniform, to avoid excessive segregation or any bias in accumulation of certain particle sizes in the spot as coarser particles tend to settle close to these charge points, we move the discharge point during the slurry deposition following the path shown in the right figure. And the deposition was complete in five lifts and it was followed by two months of self consolidation and the height of final specimen was 1.15 meters. In addition to the instrument reading, we utilized a portable CPT device to measure the in situ strength characteristics of the specimen throughout the experiment. There were 12 possible spots to run CPTU on the FCR specimen, as shown in the figure, and we used the grid to refer to the various locations on the surface. For example, CPTU 1.3 refers to the spot in the top left corner of the surface. Uh, after the deposition, the saturate unit weight and void ratio of the FCR specimen after two months of Conservation were 15.4 kN per cubic meter and 0.86 respectively. We also collected eight samples of the FCR during the deposition for sieve analysis and after the units. And as shown in the figure, the variability is high and the fine quantum range from 43% to almost 98% with average of 70%. 
according to the after the limit, the average blast resistance index came out to be seven. And overall, the FCR inside the box was classified as a standard source with low plasticity based on the unified source classification system. Using the atom limits, most of the FCR samples which represent the FCR specimen inside the box were classified as a potentially liquefiable material based on the empirical approach proposed by CETOSAL 2003. And Langer and the Brits 2006 developed the criterion to approximate the liquefaction behavior of soil based on their cyclic resistance and plasticity index. In this approach, soils with plasticity index equal or greater than seven are expected to have a clay-like behavior. And the figure shown here is taken from our paper published in Canadian Geotechnical Journal in early 2019, where we extensively studied the static and dynamic properties of FCR taken from the same tailing soil. The sample used in that study had much less plasticity in this. However, you can still see that it was located very close to the border of sand-like and clay-like behavior. And it won't be unreasonable to assume that the FCR specimen inside the box will show clay-like behavior during, during the uh, cyclic loading. In addition to the conventional laboratory tests and empirical approaches, a total of six CPTU were performed on the FCR specimen inside the box before running the shape table test. And the heterogeneity through this and across the specimen is evident when we look at the tip resistance profile. The FCR is all the way soft as the maximum tip resistance range from 20 to 47 kilopascal. The slip friction for all tests are negligible and below half. And the soil behavior index, I sub C, for all CPTUs are also above 2.6, which means that we are dealing with a clay-like material. And this observation is in agreement with our earlier hypothesis. And we further process this data to characterize the FCR specimen inside the box in terms of classification, behavior, and liquefaction susceptibility. And here we can see the CPT results in the soil behavior type charts with different arrangements all developed by Robertson in different publications. So starting with the very left figure, three CPTU tests suggest that the FCR specimen is a sensitive fine-grained soil, shown as zone one, and two CPTU classified the FCR specimen as clay silky silty clay, shown as zone four, and one CPTU was found in zone three, which represents silty clay to clays. We can say that overall the FCR is a clay fine-grained soil, and they keep the data points where they are, but in a CPT chart with different configuration. I mean, the middle figure. The middle figure shows that the FCR has behavior index greater than 2.6, which is the threshold value between sand-like and clay-like soils. And all CPTUs were found in a dashed box labeled as clay-like contractive sensitive soils. These findings match the earlier claims and conclusions about the FCR specimen. And lastly, the spitty chart divided into four zones by two lines in the last figure on the right explains the liquefaction behavior expected for our FCR specimen. As shown, all CPTUs are located in zone C, representing soil susceptible to flow liquefaction and cyclic softening. Uh, here, I'd like to spend a little bit more time on this slide to distinguish between various types of liquefaction. There are generally two types of liquefaction called flow liquefaction and cyclic softening. Flow liquefaction is resulting from strain softening and shear strain loss, and it can be triggered by both static and cyclic loading. The second type, cyclic softening, is resulting from shear stiffness loss, and it's triggered by cyclic loading. The cyclic softening has been further divided into two categories of cyclic liquefaction and cyclic mobility, and the main difference is the magnitude of the excess flow pressure generated during cyclic loading. For example, in case of limited excess flow pressure buildup inside the soil, the occurring liquefaction is referred as cyclic mobility. And I feel these explanations are necessary to better understand the following results presented today. And now it's a good point to uh, present this testing plan. Considering the index property of CPT results in the research objective, particularly the effect of strain history and aging, the testing plan was designed and consisted of three shakes, starting with a moderate shake with thick horizontal acceleration of 0.16 g and duration of 24 seconds. 
The first shake was followed by seven days of the consolation and a strong shake which had the same duration as the first shake but larger pH 8. We have been particularly very interested in seeing the potential improving effects of a moderate shake, and I mean densification, and the destructive effects of a strong shake, and I mean disturbing the dense interlocking between the particles caused by liquefaction and large strength. After the second shake, the specimen was led to reconsolidate and experience aging here called short period aging for 97 days. And of course, 97 days period doesn't represent geologic aging, but the FCR is so soft and vulnerable to large deformations that any strength gain is appreciated for stability consideration. You will see in the coming slides that how significant is the strength gain even in this short period of time. And eventually, the FCR specimen was tested under an extreme shake with high pHA and long duration to see how an extreme event can eliminate improving effects of strain history and aging. The equivalent ground acceleration and induced cyclic stress ratio during each shaking event were calculated using the simplified approach by speed and degrees and are shown uh, in the figure. Unfortunately, the results of the third shake are not presented today due to the time limit, but I will let you know where you can find the results related to this experiment at the end of uh, my presentation. And let's look at the results at this point. And here you can see that the, during the first shake, which lasts 24 seconds, negligible excess flow pressure was generated, as shown in the left box in the figure. The shake was followed by the consolidation and settlement of the specimen. The settlement, along with probably some localized excess flow pressure buildup, led to upward water movement, so the excess flow pressure could be dissipated. And this process was captured by some of the pyrometers as shown in the right box. The pore pressure was captured by the pyrometer took about 16 minutes after the shake. And this irregular pattern of pore pressure in capturing the rise with some, uh, just only a few of the pyrometers is a sign of heterogeneity inside of our sample. And the limited excess pore pressure generated during and immediately after the shake can also be an evidence of cyclic mobility in the FCR specimen. And the occurrence of cyclic mobility inside the FCR specimen was further confirmed as the sand was observed on the surface after the shake. The reconciliation took seven days as no further settlement was noticed. And after then, and the pyrometers readings were back to the initial values. Total settlement due to the first shake was 5 centimeters, and void ratio decreased from 0.86 to 0.78. The saturated unit rate also increased from 16.4 to 16.6 per newton per cubic meter. And due to small change in saturated unit rate, despite the large change in void ratio because of the lower specific gravity of FCR due to high carbon content in this material. And so, since we were not able to quantitatively confirm the occurrence of liquefaction and cyclic mobility inside the FCR specimen using the pore pressure reading and traditional pore pressure ratio criterion, we used the developed shear strain to provide more evidence for liquefaction occurrence. Uh, we basically used the 3% peak shear strain criterion introduced by Belanger and at least 2007 for clay like soils and tailings. And the figure here shows the developed shear in the FCR specimen at four elevations. The inconsistent order of shear strain again shows the stratified medium of the FCR specimen. And according to the, this criterion uh, that is shown by the red dashed lines in the figure, the FCR specimen liquefied at almost three depths. The shear strain at the lowest elevation, gamma 4, deteriorated through the shake due to densification. And now that you have somehow confirmed the occurrence of the refraction, to learn more about the effects of the first shake, four CPT were conducted after the first shake. Two CPTs were performed within 30 minutes after the shake to measure the immediate effects, and two more CPTs were conducted after seven days when the reconciliation was concluded and we could investigate the improving effects of the shake. The tip resistance reduction immediately after the shake was minimal to significant, and the decrease was up, went up to 20 kPa. However, 
The increase in the tip position after the shake and reconciliation was also significant, um, up to 20 kilopascals. For example, if we look at the CPTU 33 before the first shake shown in the left figure with the blue dash line, we see that the maximum tip position was equal to 23 kilopascals. And the right figure shows the values after the shake and seven days of reconciliation. The maximum tip resistance at the same spot and same depths reached almost 45 kilopascal, indicating more than 20 kilopascal increase in strength. And now, let's see how the FCS can perform during the second shake and how the strong shake affected the strength characteristics. The excess pore pressure build-up scenario was the same, and even smaller post-shake pore pressure rise was captured by the pedometers due to the denser structure of the specimen. According to the 3% picture, strain whole specimen liquefied this time, and this is because of the large PHA used in this shake. You can still see the inconsistent shear strain order, indication of the stratified medium of the SCR, SCR specimen again. And the order is the same as the first shake, as we observe the largest shear strain close to the surface and the smallest at the lowest elevation. And the total settlement due to the second shake was 9 centimeter, and void ratio decreased from 0.78 to 0.64. The saturated unit rate also increased from 15.6 to 16.1. And the chains are more significant compared to the first shake as the shake was stronger. And one more interesting observation during the second shake was the cyclic softening and progressive shear strain accumulation during the shake. For example, the double amplitude of strains of gamma 2 and gamma 3 were 13% and 17% at the beginning and increased to 15.5% and 24.5% at the end of the second shake, respectively. And immediately after the second shake and after 97 days after the shake, CT tests were conducted to collectively measure the effects of the strain history and aging. And these effects in the first glance were found substantial. The CT tests before the first and second shakes are clustered and shown in the left figure. If we look at the CT profile up to seven days after the second shake, we notice that they have comparable range as no significant decrease or increases observed. This means that the sample is densified and resistant enough that it doesn't easily lose strength even under a strong shake. After seven days, once the second decompression and aging commence, strength gain could be clearly observed such that the CPTU 41, which is the which is the test after 97 days, stands in front of all the preceding CPT profiles. And the t the maximum tip resistance increase is more than twice at some uh depths. To further learn about the effect of strain history on aging, three pockets representing three stages, of, three stages of before the first shake, between the first shake and second shake, and lastly, after the second shake, were developed using the mean and standard deviation of CPT data within each stage. Each pocket includes the mean plus minus one standard deviation, and they are not circular as the axis have logarithmic scale. Here again, the same data and pockets are shown in two different configurations of the CT chart. You can see that the strain history and aging overall results in strain evolution inside the FCR specimen, as the after second shake pocket locates above two other pockets as it has higher mean tip resistance. And starting with the left figure, the, the default first shake pocket is mostly found in the sensitive fine grain zone, and the first shake didn't significantly densify the specimen. However, it decreased the softness and sensitivity of the specimen. In result, you can see that the after first shake pocket shows a shift toward right and out of the sensitive zone. Further, the second shake followed by the aging period improved the resistance and strength of the specimen, and the pocket basically migrated upward, representing the sample with higher tip resistance. And if we analyze the location of the pocket relative to the line shown in the right figure, we notice that Although the strain history and aging improved the specimen in terms of the strength, the specimen still remains susceptible to slow liquefaction and cyclic suffering as the after SS, uh, second shake pocket is still mostly in zone C. And to get a picture of the aging effort, effect with more resolution, here we look at the tip resistance at a certain depth through time after the second shake. Here the results from an earlier study on a uniform twin sand which experienced a similar testing plan is included to 
First, we can notice a significant strength difference between the Queensland deposit and the soft FCO investigated in this BDP study. The second difference is the amount of time required for primary conservation and start of aging. The process for the Queensland took about 1,000 minutes, which is less than a day, while this process took about 10,000 minutes or seven days for the FCO. This difference can be attributed to the presence of high points content uh, in the FCO. However, despite to the slow rate of the consolidation, it's promising that we see more than 200% increase in tip resistance we've achieved in 97 days. At this point, uh, I'd like to make some conclusions and say that more quantitative analysis related to this experiment, including the results of a uh, third shake, are discussed in our paper, which is currently under review and hopefully will be out early next year. And for the conclusions, uh, we first thought that FCO is mostly sandy silt with low plasticity. It is potentially liquefiable with clay-like behavior based on a several limits and CPT results. Limited excess flow pressure generation on sand boards were observed and suggested the occurrence of cyclic mobility in the FCR specimen. The FCR liquefied during the shakes based on the 3% picture strength criterion. The shaking events progressively densified the FCR specimen and increased the liquefaction resistance. The CPT test showed higher tip resistance and less sensitivity as a result of strain history and aging, but the FCR remained susceptible to liquefaction. The FCR aging rate was found to be significantly slower compared to the rate of the for clean sand in the earlier study. Uh, and it's, it's been about two years that uh, we are studying this material from these different aspects, and we have published some papers. and. The paper that is specifically because of the experiment presented today is highlighted as red and hopefully it will be out early next year. And if you have questions, you can directly email me or go through those publications. Thank you for listening. Uh, Paolo, please let me know how many questions I can take at this point. Uh, we have time for uh, one question, and if it is brief, maybe a couple. Okay. Uh, Questions. Okay, I'm my in my Q and A tab, but I don't see any questions. So does it mean that nobody has questions, or I'm not seeing them? Well, um, yep, I I actually don't see. So it seemed that there was a question, but I don't see it. I I actually do have a question for you, which is. More sure. than on the, do you see it? Yeah, I, I hear. So um, my question is more than on the conclusions is on uh, the experimental campaign. So um, what was the biggest challenge in um, setting up and coming up with the experimental setup? Because my understanding is that dealing with uh, issues like aging is not an easy matter. So I was wondering if you have any uh, particular insights in the preparation of, of all of the setup. Uh, one of the issues in this experiment was making the ploy and then putting, then depositing the matter inside the box because we literally collected the matter from the tailings dam and in some drums we had pieces pretty large, so we had to first separate them because they were not representative. And second, we had to make sure that we have the right mixture without adding too much water so the pump can suck the material and put it in the box. And we had the pump clogged a few times during our test. And when it clogged, we had to separate the whole pump and fix it, and it took about an hour. So. The whole process of deposition took about two or three months. You know, it was just presented in one spot, but it took about two or three months, and we had a group of ten or twelve people helping with that process. It was pretty labor intensive. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I I thought it it would have been kind of a challenge, so that's why I wanted to kind of highlight uh, how much effort yeah. goes into it. Okay, um, I think we can now transition over to our next speaker. Thank you so much, 
uh, our Thank you. first speaker, Sajam. Um, so our next speaker will be Yuamar Imar Razan Basara. He's a PhD candidate at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, um, working with Professor Yusuf Ashash. Uh, his research focuses on nonlinear dynamics of structure interaction and the underground, of underground structures in urban areas, um, evaluating um, large-scale finite element simulations um, to study the impact of buildings on the seismic response of underground, underground structures. Um, Yomar received a scholarship from the Indonesian government in 2016 uh, to work on his PhD at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and he's also a member of the Indonesian Society of Geotechnical Engineering and a student member of the American Society of Civil Engineers. Um, so I would uh, be happy to leave the floor to you, Amar, presenting on the influence of tall buildings on seismic response of shallow underground, underground structures. Thank you very much, Paulo, for the nice introductions. Uh, my name is Yuamaru Basara. I'm a PhD candidate from University of Illinois Urbana Champaign, working with Professor Ashok Hashash. So today I'm gonna share our findings on the influence of tall buildings on the seismic response of shallow underground structures. So first of all, I would like to acknowledge our sponsor, U.S. National Science Foundation, and also our collaborator from University of Reno, Urbana Champaign, University of Colorado Boulder, Arab San Francisco, as well as our Center for Geotechnical Modeling at UC Davis. I would like also to acknowledge my sponsor who support my study at Urbana Champaign Indonesian government. So this is the outline of today's uh, presentation. I will start with the motivation and the background of the research. And we'll continue with the centrifuge modeling and followed by the numerical representation of the soil structure system. And then we will discuss about the experimental and numerical results uh, in terms of the acceleration, lateral displacement, lateral earth pressure of the underground structures, as well as the base sheet of the building. And we will end with the conclusion and the engineering implications. So, uh, underground structures generally perform really well uh, during the past earthquake compared to above ground structures. However, we have seen some damages due to the seismic shaking. For example, this is the collapse of the Daikai Station during the Kobe earthquake in 1995 because of the damage in the center columns, as you can see on the right figures, and this caused the settlement up to about 2.5 meters. And this damage uh, has raised people's attention about the importance of the seismic design of the underground structures. While in urban area, generally we, we build our underground structures just next to the tall buildings. As example for this on the left figures, we have the, the constructions of the regional connector in LA just next to the tall buildings. As well as in Indonesia, mass rapid transit under construction just next to the tall building. If you look at the illustration about this interaction between tall buildings and the underground structures, when the earthquake shaking and the wave propagate through the soil profile, and it will shake the building. And the building will generate what we call uh, the shear forces at the base or the base shear. And the question is that, uh, where does the base shear go when next to the tunnel? So from this research, we will find that this base shear will be transmitted to the underground structures in terms of the earth pressure distribution, as well as also the wrecking displacement. So, and also the question is that how significant is that uh, to capture this interaction between the tall buildings and the underground structures? First of all, I would like to briefly uh, introduce the background of the seismic design procedure for the tunnel. So the seismic response of the underground structure is mainly dominated by the inertia response of the surrounding soil because they are enclosed in the soil, unlike the above ground structures, because also they don't 
experience free privation. In practice, generally people use simplified approaches in design the underground structures do the same shaking. Uh, we can use free field checking deformation method when we apply the free field deformation on the underground structures. Or we can use show the static soil structure interaction method when we deduce the flexibility ratio, the ratio between the stiffness of the soil and the stiffness of the underground structures. Or also we can use dynamic soil structure interaction method when we apply displacement time history at the base of our numerical model. These outlines, uh, these are outlined in these references. However, uh, they have limitation, which is obviously they ignore the presence of the ages and tall structures. So how do we approach this problem? So we start with the laboratory testing. The research starts with the, to characterize the soil behavior. In this case, we have the sand. And then we perform centrifuge testing that was done in the UC Davis. So to develop a case history, and then we perform numerical simulation to evaluate the predictive capabilities of the uh, 3D numerical modeling. So we can provide some design recommendation for the seismic design of underground structures. Now we are going to look at the centrifuge test program. So we have three sets of tests. So the first test, we have uh, only underground structures. There is no building adjacent to it. So on the left, you have the tunnel. Uh, we call it Tino building. T refers to the tunnel. And on the right, we have uh, the temporary brace excavation structures. So this is, we call this Eno building. E refers to the excavation. And uh, this serve as the, the baseline model. And the next test we have, when we place our mid-rise structures just next to the underground structures, as shown here, we have mid-rise structures to represent 13 story mid rise building, but we simplify them into three degree of freedom system. And the third test, when we place our high rise structures next to underground structures here to represent 42 story high rise building. And due to the overhead space limit in the centrifuge, we simplify into one degree of freedom system. To design the mid rise and the high rise structures in the centrifuge, so the centrifuge itself imposes several restrictions. The first about the, the maximum model weight that we can have in the centrifuge, as well as the model dimension of the container, especially for the high rise uh, design, uh, when uh, the limitation of the height of the centrifuge container, so we need to uh, adjust them However, we, we still can meet the requirements of uh, real building codes. As we mentioned that uh, we design based on the real building codes to meet the seismic weight of the building, the intrastory drift and fundamental period, as well as to make sure we have realistic dimension of the mid rise and the high rise structures. We evaluate several, several structural configuration during the design process. Uh, this is the process of the design in the centrifuge. This is target mid-rise certain story building. And we perform uh, simulation in SAP to, to check the drift limit and to meet uh, the base requirement in the uh, building codes. And we select the model number two. And this is the pictures of the centrifuge model of the mid-rise structures. In the case of the high-rise building, uh, this is the typical 42-story high-rise building in California based on the uh, TBI document task 12. Similarly, as the mid-rise, we perform uh, simulation in SAP to design the structural members. Uh, and also, we evaluate them to, to, to meet the requirements of the building codes. And this is the pictures of the a high-rise model in the centrifuge. At the time, it was the largest and the heaviest model ever tested in the centrifuge. And these are the instrumentation installed uh, uh, in the tunnel. 
We have the strain gauges to measure the bending strains. We have tactile pressure sensor to measure the lateral earth pressure and accelerometers to measure the acceleration as well as uh, the displacement. Uh, these are the pictures during the preparation. Uh, in the centrifuge on the left, we have uh, the t mid-rise tunnel plus mid-rise uh, model. As you can see that the tunnel and the foundation of uh, the mid-rise building and on the right, you see that this is the mid-rise structures in the centrifuge container. On the right, you can see the photo of uh, the preparation for the EMO building. So you can see the temporary brace excavation structure, the struts, as well as the excavation wall. So these are the ground motions that were selected to cover a wide range of the levels of amplitude frequency content and duration from different parts of the world. On the left, you see the spectral acceleration. In the middle, you see the Fourier amplitude and the area density on the right. So these are the frequency interests uh, for our uh, simulations between 0.2 hertz to 10 hertz, which represent 0.1 uh, second of the period uh, to five seconds of the period. For the numerical simulation, we started from the simplest model. We have the 1D models. Uh, we perform equivalent linear and nonlinear analysis in deep soil. We perform CDB models in open seas and LS Dyna with nonlinear analysis. And then we uh, perform 2D numerical analysis in praxis for the initial design of temporary brace excavation. And then we perform three dimensional numerical simulation in LS Dyna. And uh, that will be our focus today to represent the interaction between the soil structure and the ground structures. The soil tested was Nevada sands with the relative density of 55%. Uh, this is the shear wave velocity profile for the 26 meter depth. Uh, we have several measurements of the bender element test at three locations, at three depths. However, to, to obtain continuous shear wave velocity profile, we use correlation from sheet and interest and burden and we used average of them and they are aligned with measurements. The soil constitutive model used was MAT79 hysteretic model in LS Dyna to represent nonlinear stress strain behavior. We calibrated our so, uh, soil constitutive model by matching the modulus reduction curve to the reference curve. We used calendary curves and we also performed strength correction using the pH model available in a deep soil. And these are the numerical model, the three dimensional numerical model in LS Dyna for the case of the T node building when only tunnel presents. The soil element uh, were modeled as solid element, tunnel lining as shell element, and we apply the input motion at the base as a rigid phase motion. For 15 second Kobe motions, it took about two hours to, to complete the analysis. For the mid-rise and the high-rise uh, models, uh, the beams and the columns of the mid-rise and the high-rise were modeled as beam element with linear elastic. And for the mid-rise case, for 15 second of Kobe motion with total of 25,000 elements, it took about four hours. And for the high-rise, it took about two hours. One time. For the excavation configuration, this is the numerical model for the ENO building. So you can see that the struts are modeled as the beam truss, the walls as shell elements. Similarly, with the T meter and the A high, T high rise. So in this case, excavation walls, foundation walls, and the base plate were modeled as shell elements. The strat has been elements, and similarly with previous analysis, about four hours to complete the analysis. Now we are going to look at the results uh, from the numerical simulation, as well as uh, to compare with the centrifuge measurements. We are going to look at the far field array here, the acceleration, and the lateral displacement of the tunnel and the lateral earth pressure measured by the tactile pressure sensors. 
Here is the acceleration results in the far field for a representative motion, TG motion. For the case of the null building on the tunnel, on the left you have PGA profile, in the middle you have acceleration time history, on the right you have the, you have the spectral accelerations. The red represent from numerical simulation, the black represent from the centrifuge, both are in good agreement. Similarly, for the mid-rise and for the high-rise uh, case, both uh, ls Dyna results and the centrifuge are in good agreement. If we, in terms of the relative displacement, what you see here is the racking displacement, the displacement of the tunnel on the uh, building side and on the uh, free side. This is in case of the Tino building. As you can see that the trends and the magnitudes are similar. In case of the mid-rise uh, structures, similar observation when we have similar trends and similar magnitude uh, of the racking displacement between the centrifuge and the uh, measurement. In case of the high rise, we also similarly same trends and same observations. However, we find that with the mid rise and the high rise structures, uh, there was some slight reduction of the relative displacement compared to the Tino building. This is because of the kinematic constraint provided by the mid rise and the high rise structure with basement to constrain the relative displacement of the underground structures. If you look at one-to-one -one comparison, on the left you have a comparison between LS Diana and Centrifuge for the tunnel configuration and on the right for the excavation configuration. Overall, they are uh, in one-to-one -one line, which is uh, in a good agreement. In terms of the lateral earth pressures, uh, this is uh, showing showing you the earth pressure distribution on the tunnel wall. On the left is the earth pressure, on the right is the dynamic earth pressure increment. The red represent from the LS Diner result and the black represent from the centrifuge. The distribution uh, for the Tino building was about linear distribution with depth. However, when in the case of the mid rise and the high rise case, we start seeing large forces around the top and the bottom. This is because the influence of the tall buildings uh, next to the underground structures. In practice, generally people still use Monobe Okabe and Sid and Whitman methods to design the retaining walls or underground structures. So we can also back calculate uh, the result for the case of no building, and we calculate the seismic earth pressure in coefficients, and we we found that also uh, the Mononobe Okabe and Seed and Whitman method overestimated the seismic earth pressure increments. Uh, this uh, is uh, the same observation by Nicola and Professor Starr in 2013. Now we are going to look at uh, the base shear of the building and how it correlates with the dynamic thrust increment of uh, the tunnel wall. The base shear cal was calculated using measured acceleration at each floor of the building, and we put also the no building case as uh, the zero base shear. As you can see on the left is the base shear correlation with the dynamic thrust increment on the y axis. The blue is mid rise structures. The Red is for the high rise structures, on the left is for the tunnel, and on the right for the excavation configurations. So, when the base shear increases, we observe that also the dynamic thrust increment on the wall increases, which means that when we have uh, taller buildings, we will have larger thrust increment on the underground structures. Similarly, in terms of uh, the relation between the base shear and the uh, uh, relative displacement of the uh, tunnel and the excavation, we found that as the base shear increases, the displacement of the wall increases. Uh, if you look at a given uh, base shear, the high rise model has smaller displacement than the mid rise model. This is because of the heavier structures in the high rise 
and deeper basement, which constrain the uh, displacement of the underground structures. And also at the given base here, we can compare that the displacement of the excavation is larger than the displacement in the tunnel because of the more flexible uh, system in the excavation configuration. Uh, this is the ongoing research that uh, we are working on, the building underground structure interactions that with this calibrated model that we, ha uh, we have done, we are going to perform large-scale numerical simulations. Now we are going to see more realistic effect of the more realistic superstructures, more realistic foundation system, and more soil profile. So we can now to evaluate to better understand the impact of the variability and uncertainty in the SSU system. Now we are going to conclude. So these are the conclusion. The first one is that uh, three-dimensional uh, three numerical simulation provide reliable estimates of the compact interaction, and they can be constructed and evaluated within a reasonable time frame. The common simplified pressure methods, such as Hunamabe or Kabe or seed enrichment, are not applicable in urban dense area because now we have nonlinear distribution as opposed to linear distribution assumed in their methods. And uh, we have uh, we observed that the base shear has strong correlation with the dynamic rise increment. Due to the mid rise structure, we have 12% increases, and with the high rise, we have 71 increases in dynamic rise increment. So this increase, uh, we need to consider this increase in the seismic design of underground structures of the existing adjacent building as shown as example on these figures and we have red line metro in LA just next to the E and Y building but not only the existing adjacent building we need to also to consider the future tall building and this is the new Granville side tower just next to the red line metro. Uh, thank you very much for all of your attention. Um, thank you, Yomar. I think we have time for one question. Yes. And, uh, yeah, um, so I don't but see I don't questions see, yeah. From, yeah, from the audience. I, I do have a question, actually, that I was asking sure. myself, and I think it would be interesting to share your thought about it. So it seems like you are conducting a 3D major a numerical simulation campaign and so my question is kind of like has two uh, sub questions the first one is uh, what is the supercomputer or you know the the large computer framework that you are using and second are you planning on storing all of the results and making them publicly available because it seems like that this is going to be a very, a very nice data set for future uh, studies. So I'm wondering whether at the end of the project you are planning on making all of the data publicly available perhaps uh, by means of a shared um, platform. Uh, yes. So for the first questions, uh, what the supercomputer using? For the, uh, the one that I mentioned here, two hour runtime uh, and four hour runtime, uh, we perform the simulation on uh, our local server uh, uh, in our uh, office. But for the parametric study that we are going to use, uh, that we are going to perform, we are going to uh, use the supercomputing facilities in the uh, Texas Austin Stampede that uh, to, to 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 be able to run large scale simulations. And of, uh, for the second questions that. Uh, yes, uh, for the for this calibrated uh, numerical model and also the results are already published uh, in uh, Journal of Geotechnical Geotechnical and Geoenvironmental Engineering in by Professor Hasha Septal in 2018. But uh, yes, for the next uh, numerical large scale study, we are also going to uh, to make this available for the practice so they can use this as a guideline also that can uh, be beneficial for the uh, future research. Okay, 
Um, so thank you so much, Yomar. Thank you again for thank your you. presentation. I, I think we can now move on uh, to the next presentation. Our third presenter um, will be Okan Ilan, also a PhD candidate from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, Okan uh, works in the civil engineering department, um, and uh, he participated in a number of different projects, including the risk reduction project of Istanbul Pipeline Network um, and uh, others. And uh, during his PhD, his research focuses on modeling of simulation-based site amplification of Central and Eastern North America SINA using deep learning techniques and conventional regression models. Um, he has a number of journal papers and conference papers published on uh, modeling of site amplification uh, in this area, and uh, we'll be very happy to learn more about this topic. His presentation is entitled Deep Learning Based Site Amplification Models for Central and Eastern North America. So without further ado, I will uh, please, uh, I will invite Hokan Ilan to make his presentation. Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you very much uh, for a very nice uh, introduction. Uh, I am uh, Okan Ilhan. Uh, I am a fourth year a PhD candidate under supervision of Professor Hashash in University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Today, I'm going to share my work on the deep learning based site amplification models for Central and Eastern North America. And also, thank you very much for sharing uh, the opportunity with me to share my work with you. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank a number of people for their great contribution to my work as Professor Stewart, Professor Ratchi, Dr. Kenneth Campbell, Dr. Walter Silva, and Dr. Joseph Harmon. And also, I would like to acknowledge my sponsor as the Ministry of National Education of the Republic of Turkey, since it partially funds my uh, study. Uh, here is the outline of my study. I would like to first uh, start with the motivation behind my study, which is followed by the objective of uh, the study. And after that, I will introduce the parametric study design that allows me to uh, run large-scale site response uh, simulations for uh, the characterization of the site amplification at Central and Eastern North America. And after that, I will introduce uh, site amplification functions use conventional nonlinear regression techniques uh, that using these uh, is, is, is simulations coming from large-scale site response simulation. And after that, I will present the alternative models as deep learning based site, ampli site amplification models for Central and Eastern North America. And after that, I will conclude my presentation. Uh, as a motivation, uh, the Central and Eastern North America is known to be a stable continental region with few strong ground motion recordings. And uh, large-scale site response simulations and simulation-based models in, re in recent paper uh, by Harmer 2019 were performed to characterize the site amplification in Central and Eastern North America. Even with the significant improvement by these recently developed functions, the limitations persist relative to the large error of side amplification, side amplification which I will uh, illustrate in my following slides. And considering this issue, the additional modeling refinements and also the alternative approaches are needed to capture the complex behavior of simulation by side amplification in Central and Eastern North America. As considering the motivation, the main objective of my study developed robust response spectrum, side response spectrum and Fourier amplitude spectrum side amplification models using the simulations of site, condi site conditions in Central and East North America. But just for this presentation, I will present the simulations and models for the response spectrum side amplification. And for my study, it is 
performed in a workflow which is composed of four different main components. The first one is the generation of inputs for uh, one-dimensional site response analyses. And the parametric study that I will introduce results in over 148,000 of unique profiles. And it is performed in approximately one day using 1,316 logistic cores. And using these profiles and a series of motions, uh, the parametric study uh, performs uh, three, over 3.6 million nonlinear plus equivalent linear plus linear one dimensional site response analyses. And this is performed in approximately six days using uh, 2000 logistic cores. And all of these simulations and also the site profiles are almost corresponds to approximately six terabytes of data and all these uh, data is preserved in MongoDB NoSQL database, which is also available to researchers through DesignSafe. And as a last item, uh, using all of these simulations, the neural network based models trained and also the side amplification functions using conventional regression techniques are developed. And for the sake of your information, uh, all these study workflow can be completed in 14 days using the high performance competing resources of Stampede in Texas Advanced Computing Center. Before going into details, I would like to first define the side amplification that is adopted in this presentation. Here, the side amplification is defined as the natural logarithm of ratio of ground motion intensity measure at surface and ground motion intensity measure at rock outcrop. And the side amplification is commonly described as the sum of the linear and nonlinear components. And the linear components, which is denoted here as SF sublin, is, is assumed to occur under low intensity earthquakes and is only dependent upon the site properties. For nonlinear amplification, it is assumed to occur under large intensity earthquakes and is dependent upon on both site properties and ground motion intensities. Uh, this is the parametric study tree that allows me to run the large scale site response simulations. And uh, as seen in the presentation, it, it is composed of a number of elements. And I will, if, if I would like to introduce them, in the first case, there are 248 synthetic motions, which, is, uh, which represents the characteristics of the Central and Eastern North America. And there are some representative shear wave velocity profiles of uh, Central and Eastern North America site conditions. And also there, there are corresponding, there are corresponding nonlinear soil and rock material properties, which are used to calculate the nonlinear dynamics for uh, nonlinear and equivalent linear site response simulations. And using these uh, representative VS profiles and also the di dynamic curves, uh, there are uh, random uh, randomizations on these, uh, or randomizations on them are performed to capture the uncertainty and variability in site conditions of Central and Eastern North America. And also the variation of soil profile depth to weather track zone for deep depth dependent site amplification is considered using the uniformly distributed uh, depth winds. And to represent the transition from the soil part to the hard rock condition of Central and Eastern North America, which has shear wave velocity of 3000 meters per second, uh, the uh, weather track zone, uh, different weather, weather track zone models are uh, identified in the parametric study. And as I mentioned previously, this whole parametric study uh, results in over 3.6 million nonlinear, equivalent linear, and linear site response analyses. And this is the largest uh, nonlinear site response study conducted thus far. 
Now, uh, considering the definition of site amplification and using the site response simulation study, also there are separate uh, site amplification functions, uh, site amplification functions for linear amplification and nonlinear amplification using the nonlinear using the uh, conventional nonlinear regression method. I'm going to introduce two different models for linear amplification. The first one is uh, the first one is the VS30 based model, which is which I call here as L1 model, and this is a piecewise function composed of three regions. As the first region is no amplification, the second region is the uh, linear amplification or amplification which is linearly scaled by the nature logarithm of VS30, and the last part is the curved region to capture the soft and deep soil response. The second linear model is the L5 model, which considers both VS30 and site natural period effects. And the site natural period effects here is thought to occur due to the sharp impedance contrast in the hard rock, sharp, uh, hard, hard rock condition of Central and Eastern North America and the overlying sediment. And it is evaluated using the residuals of these VS30 based and one model, which here is defined, the residuals defined as the natural logarithm of the ratio of the simulated amplification and the L1 model estimation, which is shown in the figure here. And uh, this is the model that, uh, this is the this is the model form of L5 model, including the Ericker wavelet to capture the peak due to these uh, natural period effects. Um, the next model is nonlinear amplification model. Uh, the nonlinear amplification model is uh, uses the amplification. Uh, the, uses the difference between the amplification directly coming from nonlinear simulations and the amplification coming from linear simulations. And this plot is showing the uh, the moral estimations along with the uh, along with the amplification data, uh, uh, nonlinear amplification data. And here is the model form which is adapted from uh, uh, Choi and Young's 2008 and Sehan and Stewart 2014 functional form. Uh, after the introduction of these model form, I would like to mention about the performance of these models on how well it, they can capture the simulation based side amplification. And I will do that by uh, evaluating the model residuals. And here are the model residuals showing for L5 model, which is linear model using VS30 and site natural period, uh, represented by the green dots. Uh, and also I'm going to, uh, I, I'm, uh, the second model is the L5 plus N2 model, which is linear plus non, represents the model estimations for linear plus nonlinear simulations. And the first row is showing the L5 model, and the second row is showing the L5 plus N2 model, and the first row is showing the estimations and amplification data for 0.1 second, and the second column Sorry, the first column is 0.1 second. The second column is for one second. And the important point that I would like to mention here is that even with the complex functional form of these L5 model, including almost nine coefficients, we are seeing the deviation in mean residuals here, which are denoted by the uh, black, uh, the, sorry, the uh, the blue rectangles, uh, and also the we are seeing the large spread of model residuals, which are uh, denoted here the gray dots, uh, even with the complex functional form of L5 model. And also the similar response uh, observed in the L5 plots and two model uh, residuals, which is in the second row of these plots. And also this model also includes almost, uh, and includes the 12 coefficients. And this plot, uh, this plot uh, tell us that Improving model estimations require either additional terms to be included in these functional forms or require either uh, more complicated functional forms to deal with the complex nature of the simulation based side amplification. But instead of uh, going into this direction, uh, here I would like to mention about the deep learning based side amplification model as an alternative model. And here I am presenting the structure in this slide. I'm presenting the structure of the 
neural network model. And before going into details, I would like to mention that the neural network models can learn the side amplification data without consideration of any predetermined functional forms. And also they can significantly improve the simulation by side amplification estimations as compared to the conventional side amplification functions, which I previously introduced as L5 and L5 plus N2 model. Uh, if I go, would like to go into the details of the uh, neural network model, the firstly, the I totally using the same inputs of the uh, uh, of the conventional uh, conventional side amplification functions as for for a, a neural network based model for the linear amplification. I am I am only using VS30 and TNet as corresponding to the L5 model. And for the total amplification, which is linear plus nonlinear amplification, I am using VS30, site nature opening it, and PGA at rock. And for your information, the 90% of data is used to train the neural network models, and the remaining 10% is used for testing the predictive capability of neural network based models. And this is uh, uh, for the calculations of neural network, I'm using uh, for both linear amplification and nonlinear amplification, I am using exactly the same structure. And also for the uh, hidden layers where the neural network uh, training are performed, I'm using two different layers, which have which each of has two different nodes uh, for the calculations. And for your information, I am using the TensorFlow library, which is uh, a library that is used in a Python environment and developed by Google Brain Team for my uh, neural network based uh, site and model training. And for as an output, this neural network uh, output the response spectrum amplification estimation simultaneously at 22 periods between 0.001 and 10 seconds. Uh, if I would like to evaluate the neural network model estimations, I, I am going to do that using uh, by comparing them uh, with, uh, using the corres their corresponding uh, conventional side amplification functions. And here, uh, the first row of plots showing the L5 model estimations for linear amplification for 0.1 second first column and point and one second for second column. And the second row is showing the L5 plus and two model estimations on linear plus nonlinear amplification. And again, the first column is 0.1 second and the second column is one second. And if I project the corresponding neural network estimations on top of them, the first thing that I see is that the peak amplification uh, in the central and eastern North America, which we are seeing uh, due to the uh, significant site natural period effects, uh, the neural network model allows to better capture the height and location of the peak amplification in both linear and total amplification in, uh, and also the, if you look at the neural network estimations as compared to the conventional models, the estimations are more compatible with the scatter, uh, scatter of the site amplification data. Uh, for further evaluation, I would like to also look at the residuals of the neural network models and also corresponding uh, conventional site amplification functions. Again, the first row is showing the for the linear amplification, the second row is showing linear plus nonlinear amplification. And here, the residuals is defined as the natural logarithm of simulated amplification divided by the model estimations. The main point here is, is that after the use of the neural network model estimations, the mean residuals almost uh, become zero as compared to L5 plus uh, L5 and L5 plus N2 models. And also, if you look at the model, uh, scatter of the model residuals, th there is observable reduction after uh, use of the neural network models, and also which is here denoted by the pink dots. And in the last step uh, of the evaluation, 
I would like to also evaluate the model errors of the neural network estimations and also the corresponding conventional side amplification functions. And here I am using the root mean skewing error definition for error calculation and also for your information, all these estimations, residuals, and also error, ca error calculations are performed using the testing subset of data, which is 10% of data. And the left one is showing the errors for the linear amplification at 22 periods, and the uh, plus at the right side uh, showing the linear plus nonlinear amplification. And after the use of the neural network, uh, the neural network allows to reduce the root mean square error of estimations up to 30%, both linear amplification and linear plus nonlinear amplification. And to conclude my slides, presentations, uh, the, uh, in the first case, this study uh, allows to uh, propose a workflow that allows to run large-scale site response simulations as over 3.6 uh, million simulations, along with the development of neural network-based and site amplification functional forms using the high-performance computing system uh, resources. And as I mentioned, recently developed site amplification functions produces significant improvements, but has inherent limitations, which prevents capturing the complex complex behavior of simulation by site amplification. And but neural network models, which can which can be applicable to any type of amplification without consideration of predetermined functional forms. It can be, it, they can better capture the distinct features of side amplification and represents the spread of amplification data. It allows to reduce the error estimations up to 30% for both linear and linear plus nonlinear as total response spectrum side amplification. And as a limitation of neural network model, they are intended to be used for the interpolation of data within the training space, but it should be noted that the neural network is not an extrapolation method. And thank you very much for uh, listening to my work. Thank you so much, Okan. Uh, I think we have time for one brief question. Um, let's see if there's any from the audience. Um, I don't see questions from the audience. Actually, I had a question that was, um, you partially answered it in your last point of your conclusions. Um, mm -hmm. We know that artificial intelligence-based methods are very extremely helpful. Uh, as you've shown in your presentation, extrapolation is often an issue. My question is, what, what do you see as challenges in using artificial intelligence models in the future in geotechnical earthquake engineering, besides extrapolation that we know uh, it's already an issue that um, can't be dealt with essentially when using such uh, algorithms. Uh, if I understand correctly, you asked uh, what can be the challenges in using neural network uh, based side amplification models uh, for future developments in geotechnical fields. Did I understand yes. correctly? Yes. Well, not not only not only uh, you know the site amplification models, but just in general, you know. What is the future of these model types in the field of geotechnical earthquake engineering? What do you see as a good application? What do you see as the challenges? Uh, as a good application, uh, as I mentioned, uh, for the for in uh, in terms of the side amplification functions, you know, in order to develop side amplification functions, you you need to look at the data trends. You need to visually inspect the data and etc. and you know, need to come up with uh, some functional forms uh, that, you know, uh, and also you need to, be, you, be, and people need to, people need to regress it or, you know, try to deal with the coefficients and et cetera, et cetera. But in neural network models, there is no such issue. Uh, you can just uh, use the similar type of structure for all type of amplifications, for example, this one spectrum, Fourier, and it, it can capture all of them better as compared to the side amplification functions. But if we look at the, it's, uh, the, the challenges that are using it, uh, the first thing is that uh, I think uh, it, is, uh, it is relatively a new subject uh, that 
people uh, use it. Uh, I'm not sure can be used, uh, can be adopted uh, easily in the uh, next, uh, in the, you know, in the following, but uh, also the extrapolation is also the second challenge. You know, what I mean extrapolation is that, uh, for example, here I have a site database and if I have a site which is outside of the site database, the, the neural network cannot produce a reasonable estimate, but uh, just for the sake of uh, for the sake of compensating this issue, the, also the currently the, the conventional models, side amplification models are available at least to uh, produce the estimations for these sites. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, yeah. Uh, this was, I think, an excellent presentation. Uh, looking forward to. Uh, future applications. So thank you so much. Um, my name, as I had the opportunity to mention at the beginning, is Paolo Zimmaro. I'm a project scientist and lecturer at UCLA, and my current research focuses on uh, soil liquefaction and big data in geotechnical engineering. My today's presentation um, will be on the use of the of big data in geotechnical engineering, the next generation liquefaction project. So let me start right in. Um, my, the outline of the presentation is as follows. I'll have a brief introduction on uh, liquefaction characterization and needs. Then I'll talk a little bit about big data in civil engineering. Uh, and I will be discussing the difference between collection of data versus formal databases. And then I will be talking a little bit about the next generation liquefaction project. Uh, I will then transition over to how to handle big data and geotechnical engineering by means of cloud-based data analysis tools. And then I'll have some final remarks. So let me start with an introduction of what we are dealing with. So we are uh, going to talk about soil liquefaction and its effect. So when, I'm be talk when I'll be talking about liquefaction manifestations, I'll be uh, essentially talking about sand boils, uh, ground deformations in general, lateral spread, and so forth. Uh, here I have a photo of a liquefaction manifestation following a recent earthquake in California the Ridgecrest 2019 event. Uh, we're going to deal with uh, effects on uh, superstructure and infrastructure. And this is an example from Coachelli 1999 in Turkey. Uh, of course, there is a strong effect on infrastructure. This is, an, this is a photo from Northridge 1994. And uh, we also have uh, ways of analyzing regional scale impacts. Uh, and this is a screenshot from a paper published by Juan Balegoy and collaborators in 2014 on the Christchurch earthquake sequence in New Zealand, 2010-2011. So the liquefaction triggering assessments um, in the current status are pretty much based on relatively small data sets. And this is a, a plot I've taken, I've taken from uh, a paper published by Boulanger and Idris. Um, sorry. And uh, we only have a few sites that are especially consequential in current liquefaction triggering assessment. Uh, we have alternate liquefaction models providing different outcomes. And uh, liquefaction assessments today heavily rely on data, and as you've seen, uh, just a few data points may make the difference. So this is where we currently stand. In our current liquefaction databases, we have a number of older case histories that I'm calling here legacy case histories. Uh, this is just an example of a legacy case history from the 1977 Brancia earthquake in Romania. As you can see here, uh, because of the poor uh, documentation that we have and uh, a relatively um, hard to reconstruct ground motion uh, characteristics in the area, uh, we have large uncertainties uh, on the demand and on the capacity side. So here on the right uh, end corner, 
uh, of this slide, I'm plotting the cyclic stress ratio on the y-axis. This is the demand and the penetration resistance on the x-axis. This is ca the capacity. And for older legacy case histories, the spread of uncertainties in both uh, x and y-axis is pretty large. More recent earthquakes allowed us to have an unprecedented quantity and quality of observations. And uh, for example, in recent years, we, got, we gained a lot of information from the uh, Christchurch uh, earthquake sequence in 2010, 2011, for which we have a lot of information about the spatial distribution of liquefaction manifestation and lack thereof uh, uh, across a large area shaken by multiple earthquakes. Uh, we also have uh, remote sensing data, high quality satellite information. So this is all adding up to an unprecedented quantity and quality of observations. The, the same thing can be said for uh, other earthquakes, for example, the Emilia 2012 earthquake in, in uh, Northern Italy. Observations are better, but we also have a better quality of digital networks. So we record ground motion in a better manner. This means that we have a better ground motion characterization, we have a higher quality magnitude estimation, and so uh, also the demand side of things is better characterized. There's a problem though. We have a large quantity of data, and with that comes a need for properly storing all of the, the data. In, in uh, Traditionally, in uh, geotechnical engineering, we've been using spreadsheets to uh, construct um, archives of data, um, and uh, this is not unfortunately viable when it comes to big data as it is in liquefaction analysis nowadays. So instead of using spreadsheets or similar types of data storage, we are now we now need to move towards relational databases. In a previous presentation today, we've seen that large simulation campaigns can be results from large simulation campaigns can be stored in relational databases. This can be done similarly for uh, case histories of liquefaction. And so, let me give you an example of what a database may look like. So here I have a table where I have earthquake events with magnitude, epicentral latitude and longitude, recording station names, uh, shear wave velocity uh, in the upper, time average shear wave velocity in the upper 30 meters, PS30, uh, joiner more distance RJB and peak ground acceleration PGA. So if I have the same earthquake recorded by multiple stations, I'm repeating a row in that table and uh, by doing that, I repeat all of the information pertaining to that specific earthquake event. In the same manner, if I have a second earthquake recorded by the same station that recorded the first earthquake, I'm gonna repeat all of the information about the station twice or multiple times, depending on how many times that recording station recorded earthquake. In reality, we can actually subdivide such a table, in this case, in three main elements. So the first subsection of the table pertains to earthquake events, and it has information about the name, the magnitude, the latitude, the longitude of the epicenter. And then we have recording stations, and each um, information pertaining to a recording station is then reported in this subsection of the table. And lastly, we have information about the ground motion when an earthquake is recorded by a station. So if we start thinking about a modular way of storing data and collecting data, we can now visualize how a relational database works. So we can separate out pieces of information. We can store these pieces of information in separate tables. So for the example I just gave you, I will have an event table, a station table, a ground motion table. Each Entry in each table will have a so-called primary key, which is this yellow key here um, that you can see for each uh, table. 
the primary key is a unique identifier for each entry in the table, and it is a unique identifier, so it cannot be repeated. The white key that, she, that you see in the ground motion table represents foreign keys. Foreign keys are fields in one table that are helpful to identify records in another table. So by means of foreign keys, we don't need to carry information from another table and repeat those, but we just need to report the field as a foreign key. So the, uh, as you can see here, we have an earthquake event table, we have a recording station table, and then we have a table that has earthquake event and station ID as the foreign key. This is the ground motion table. This means that every time a recording station records an earthquake, we're going to have a new entry in the ground motion table without repeating all of the information in the previous tables. So by using a relational database, we may make our database data access faster. We can use advanced tools to query the database. And of course, we minimize duplicated fields, avoiding null fields. So there are many benefits in using relational databases as we move forward towards big data and geotechnical engineering. So to just uh, give you uh, a very simple comparison, we are trying to move from a spreadsheet-based traditional data analysis, which may represent an old uh, fiat car, to the next generation of relational databases where we can use big data analytics. And these will represent, in my view, the Ferrari of data storage in geotechnical engineering. So after talking about what relational databases are, let me introduce you the concept that we developed as part of the Next Generation Liquefaction Project. So in the Next Generation Liquefaction Project, we are storing um, data from legacy and new case histories by using 55 tables. We have four main sections. We have general information. We have information pertaining to a specific site, including, including site characterization by means of comp penetration tests, uh, standard penetration tests, shear velocity profiles, and so forth. We have a section on earthquake observations. And of course, we have a section on earthquake event characterization. So this is a large database that allows us to store all of this information where each table is related uh, to each other by means of primary foreign key combinations. We also have a graphical interface to access and uh, uh, download and upload the data. We've had a few iterations. We've been, we started with a beta version where we've been combining SQL codes with CSV files. We then moved towards a fully uh, SQL database. Uh, this is the official release that you'll find online at www.nextgenerationliquefaction.org. Uh, this website graphical interface will allow you to upload data, to download data, and we also have a quality control system in place that allows reviewers to review every single piece of information. So everything is going to be flagged as high quality. Um, this is um, where the database is stored, and as you can see here, this is an example site. Uh, for you know, one site, we may have a number of observations and site characterization data. Uh, the, the database is pretty interactive, so you can actually click on each point and, on, and see what the observation was, what kind of site characterization is there, and what type of ground uh, motion characterization is available for the site. And of course, uh, in the future, you gain more data, you have additional information for an, for an existing site, you can actually contribute to that site by adding to it. So it will allow for a very nice uh, regional uh, analysis of liquefaction characterization. As you know, of course, we are uh, handling a very large amount of high-quality data, so how do we handle them properly? So the idea was to replicate the database daily onto the Zion Safe uh, at the uh, University of Texas at Austin. Uh, we developed a number of Jupyter notebooks that are available through community data in the Zion Safe to interact with the data. And of course, we also have an online dictionary in order for you to better see 
what are the primary foreign keys that we have in the database so it's, it's going to be easier to query all of the data the the cloud-based analysis tools i've been talking about are part of the ngl partner data app onto the design safe you can click on uh, partner data app uh, after you create an account in design safe and then there's an icon where there is the symbol and the logo of the NGL project. You can click on Launch NGL Jupyter Notebook, and you will be redirected in a folder. The folder contains a number of pretty uh, much available uh, Jupyter Notebooks that are ready for you to use, each of, of which has a graphical interface. Uh, but of course, you can also come up with your own uh, Jupyter Notebook by using these Jupyter Notebooks that are already available as a starting point. We have, for example, CPT Viewer for compenetration test results. Uh, the same thing for standard penetration tests. We have uh, Viewer for shear wave velocity invasive tests or non-invasive shear wave velocity methods. Uh, for the current presentation, uh, I won't be able to show you all of the Jupyter Notebooks that are available, but I would like you to provide uh, just a brief uh, overview of the CPT viewer that is kind of representative of all of the other ones. So you will be clicking on the CPT viewer, you click on cell, you run all, and after you do that, you can actually interact with all of the CPT data in the NGL uh, database. So we'll have a panel where you can select the site. Each site will have one or more uh, compenetration test uh, profiles. You can actually search for the ones you would like to, to look at, and then you'll be able to also uh, introduce the inverse filtered profiles by following the approach proposed by Boulanger and De Jong recently. You can then select a specific profile range, uh, and then you can then uh, you can then take a look at the cumulative distribution of uh, the whole profile as well as of uh, the range you're selecting, so that you can actually uh, analyze each layer separately, and you can gain insight into issues related to layering effects, for example. Uh, similar. Uh, Jupyter Notebook's graphical interface are available for standard penetration tests and the Shiway velocity profiles. All of the queries, all of the code uh, are actually available online, and so you can definitely uh, use those tools as a starting point for building your own queries, because the goal here will be to allow people in the future to use these queries, to use these tools to perform advanced analysis and possibly uh, to create models out of these data sets. So um, other tools, as I said, we also have example queries where you can learn by looking at what we've done already, and you can import, copy and paste, you can create your own, as I said. So these tools are not meant to be just a standalone tools that you can use, but you can build upon them to create new models and to browse through big data that is available at the next generation liquefaction database. So uh, this was actually my uh, last slide. I have some final remarks. Uh, as we've seen also from the previous presentations, there is a need in the community now for high quality transparent databases in geotechnical engineering. We are going towards big data. And so we need such tools and capabilities for big data analytics by using uh, and leveraging uh, the potential of relational databases and other similar tools, we can actually uh, make a very good use of big data that we have available, and this represents a transformational shift from past practices. This is meant to be something usable for industry and research, of course, uh, we made the, all of the data of the next generation liquefaction database available in the cloud via the design space. The database, of course, is growing, and every single piece of information in the database is reviewed, so it's high quality. We provide already some post-processing tools, 
not users and the feeling they will not play around processing tools, creating the database, and of course, uh, create new tools uh, as they wish. So this was my uh, last slide. I'm uh, hoping that um, this is uh, something that will be helpful uh, in, um, in the future for you. And thank you so much for uh, listening to my presentation and uh, to the overall uh, webinar series. Let me take a second to thank, uh, on behalf of the Geo Institute Earthquake Engineering and Soil Dynamics Technical Committee, uh, to acknowledge the support of uh, all of the committees that made these uh, session together. And I would also like to uh, thank uh, all of the speakers and all of the staff that helped us putting together the session and allowing us to have the session delivered in a smooth manner, I hope. So thank you so much again. Thank you, everyone. That concludes your conference call for today. You may now disconnect. Thank you for joining and have a very good day.